Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. As we prepare to return to the study in Ezekiel 33, shall we give thanks for all that our Heavenly Father is doing, for the way in which he is leading us, for the way in which he is instructing us, for that which he is showing us that we need at this time? Shall we give praise for that which he is doing and seek him so that as we open his word, we might more clearly understand all that he would have us to know at this time? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we need you. We need you greatly. There is much that is going on, many things that we need to understand, many things that we need to see revealed in our lives before we are prepared to give a message. We thank you for this opportunity of joining together in worship. We thank you for the many blessings that you provided over this last week, for the many tests, trials, and challenges that have come upon us. For we know that you give these tests and these trials to those which you love and which love you. Prove us now, Father. Direct us. Help us that we may have strength to endure the fire of affliction, that your will may be done in our lives. We ask for your Spirit's guidance. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to direct us. We ask for your angels to surround us. Help us now to join together, to consider together that which you would have us to know. May your will be done in all ways and in all things in this study. For this, we thank you, and this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when we left off last week, we had covered this portion. The saving of human souls is an interest infinitely above any other line of work in our world. Whoever is brought under the influence of the truth and through faith is made a partaker of Christ's love is by that very fact appointed of God <clears throat> to save others. He has a mission in the world. He is to be a co-laborer with Christ, making known the truth as it is in Jesus. And when men in any line of work seek to bring the minds and the talent of the Lord's human agents under their control, they have assumed a jurisdiction over their fellow men that they cannot maintain without injustice and iniquity. And the Lord has placed no man as judge, either of the pen or of the voice of God's workmen. We now come to another non-published article. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and have been assured of, no of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Second Timothy 3, 12 to 15. There must be a watching for souls, as they must give an account. And here Mrs. White gives reference to Ezekiel 33, 1 to 20, which is where we have been studying these last several weeks. Is there not as great need at this time for warnings and reproofs as at any period of this earth's history. And warnings will come, discovering the hidden things of darkness. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. There are individuals who require plain words of reproof, and the apostle says, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear, First Timothy 5.20. So if all scripture is given by inspiration of God, then is the entire Bible to be considered worthy for us to study? Amen. Are we to separate any portion of the Bible saying that this is not worthy of our study. That's 
That would be no amen. Okay. So when we have one that portends, that pontificates, that portions of the Bible are not presented properly, and that we should not focus on these things, that we should only focus on the love of Christ. How are we to respond? Well, we saw actually when we were studying um, uh, the principles of prophetic interpretation as laid out by um, Lewis F. Weir, so we are studying mm-hmm. morning studies, that uh, I'm just trying to find it here, but basically he, he, he says that every everything in the scriptures reveals Christ that we, that really you can't study something in the scriptures and not see Christ in some way or other. So whether that's the prophecies, whether it's the Proverbs or the Psalms or whether it's the, the narratives, the historical narratives, that all of these things are about the gospel they're about Christ, about the work that he wants to do, whether it's it's done symbolically, typically, or whether it's the direct, uh, you know, references. So I really don't think that, uh, you know, the idea that somehow there are parts of the Bible or things that we uh, shouldn't study is is kind of, well, it, it's it, that lacks insight. The reason I ask the question is is quite simple. There are those that would say that portions of Scripture, especially those that had major impact with Father Miller, were used improperly. So you're saying um, who who is using them improperly? The Scriptures. What, what do you mean? Well, how did one of the one of the points that Father Miller made in his discourses, and this is a, a point that is very prominent on both the 1843 and the 1850 charts, has to do with the 2300 days, correct? Mm-hmm. Yet, how did Father Miller come to understand the validity of the 2300 days? Well, first he he discovered the twenty five twenty, correct, and then the twenty three hundred days, and then the thirteen thirty five, and he found that all three came together to show the all to end in about the year eighteen forty three. So that's from the time that he had finished his study. That was twenty five years hence. So, you know, he he used all of Scripture. He wasn't just taking the twenty three hundred days by itself. Right. Now, it's always interesting to me that within the corporate church, that when we mention the seven times or we mention the 2520, that there are those that are willing to say how this is a false prophecy. Leviticus 26 is very specific. We have in this book, 13 verses that offer a series of blessings if we obey God's commandments and his statutes. But yet we have a series of verses that follow this that are very specific about what will happen if we choose not to follow the commandments and statutes. Did the children of Israel follow the commandments and the statutes that were laid out for them at Sinai. Well, uh, all that the Lord has said we will do, but they didn't. Right. Did they, after Sinai and after the Babylonian captivity, did they do all of the commandments and the statutes as lined out for them by Moses in the Torah. What would you say? Well, people didn't do everything that they, that they were instructed to do. 
I mean, it depends which time you're talking about. Are you talking like immediately afterwards? The history of the children of Israel is fraught with times where they would see their great failures. So, yeah, so at times they would follow God and times they wouldn't. Yes, I would agree with that. The question is, did they follow all of the commandments and all of the statutes? And as I, as I have read and I have observed and as we have studied, I think it would be very clear that they did not follow all of the commandments and they did not follow all of the statutes. Well, like the rest of the land, I mean, at some point they did follow it, right? Okay. And then once they got a king, they no longer followed it. Right. So so I guess I'm just really picky about the fact that they did obey all of God's commands at certain times, just not continually. Right. Yeah. Now, in this in this particular manuscript, Mrs. White states... There are times when private reproof has no effect. The Lord knows better than human beings the needs of his people. He does not consult man's imperfect judgment as to how he shall work in bringing reproof to his people. The charge of Paul is, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. Some men's sins are open before him, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest before him, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So in this I would I would say that this is first Timothy five Verses 21, 22, 23, and 21, 22, 24, and 25. Is observing a few of the commandments enough for salvation? No. Agreed. Yeah. Well, well this is kind of the same as, you, as your other question regarding yes. is all scripture inspired? Should, should we take it all equally? Because the scriptures reveal Christ. That's... You know, the whole Bible tells of Christ from the first record of creation to the closing promise. We are reading of his works and listening to his voice. That's uh, Steps to Christ, page 92 and 93. So uh, there is this, um, this this other statement of Ellen White's where she talks about inspiration, that it's it's a mixture of the divine and the human. Right. The scriptures are are God speaking through men. And. And then she says, uh, you know, the the human and the divine, the divine and the human mixed together uh, becomes the word of God. But she parallels that with the Christian life where human nature with divine power does not commit sin. Right. So we can see that there is in, in the connection of obedience uh, to God, it's connected to the understanding that that God's that the whole counsel of God is needed. So just as if you if you uh, you know you commit one of sin against one of the commandments, you have have transgressed against all of the commandments. And and so the same with God's word, you, you can't accept just some of God's word and not all of God's word. Now, you know, how this relates to uh, this idea here, because this is, you know, Ezekiel 33 dealing with the watchman. So it's the repeat of chapter three. You know, God's people had not been faithful, right? Jerusalem had been destroyed in Ezekiel 33, because he's going to have in verse 21 of Ezekiel 33, you're going to have the escapee come and on the, you know, the one who has seen the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So, I mean, there's, there's something here, I guess, you know, I mean, I never really thought about before, but 
we can see how accepting all of God's word is connected with obedience to God. Right. Right. It's a direct correlation, I guess, is a simple way to put it. It's a very it's a very apt way of putting it. Now, here's my the ultimate reason behind my question. If the word of God, if the entire word of God. If all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, then is, are all scripture given to us by the adversary? What do you mean all scripture given to us by the adversary? That's a simple question. Well, no, I mean, he doesn't give us all scripture, but he does give us some scripture. Right. He quotes to Christ uh, in the wilderness. You know, um, yeah, he doesn't give scripture. it to us. He, he he doesn't give it to us. He uses the scriptures. Yes. Yeah. There I agree. I think that's what you were looking for, Dwight. Yes, that is. So when we have a when we have an evangelist that claims to be of God's people that claims that Leviticus 26 is being misapplied in its understanding and that this is part of, quote, Satan's bag of tricks, unquote. How should we refute them? How should we stand up? Well, I mean, the main the main thing that uh, that we have to address is is using Miller's rules, looking at all of the scriptures. Right. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that I find, um, you know, in, in my study that, that I did on the 2520, when I initially started looking into it, is that none of the people who were the opponents of the 2520 ever really told you what the 2520 was. Right. Could they really didn't, say they the didn't. number. You know, some of them can say they remember, yeah, but you know, the people who were opposing it, it was always based upon um that it's not a it's not a prophecy. Um and they would they would argue over uh things like Ellen White didn't say anything about it and so forth, right? But they never they never really presented what it was that they were objecting to. Right? One is because most of them had no idea what it was that they were objecting to. They had never studied the 2520. And so I'd have people come and say, uh, oh, I looked into the 2520 and it's it's error. And I would ask them a simple question. Can you explain what the 2520 is? And and they couldn't. They didn't know what it was. They would just sort of deflect, well, it's not a prophecy, you know, Many people say it's not a prophecy, but it's clearly a prophecy. They wouldn't even just say it's not a time prophecy. They'd just say it's not a prophecy at all. And no analysis of the verses, no no explanation of how it's understood. And even people like Stephen Bohr, when he opposed the 2520, you know, he, he, he looked into it a little more than some. So he knew that there was more than one 2520. But... He didn't want to address the prophetic mirror or anything like that. Because once you start looking at the 2520, it become, becomes pretty clear that it's something that supports Adventism. So, you know, it's now I'm sort of going a bit off track. So one of the things that I was wanting to say about this is that when there is something that, that is true, and I've said this many times, that people they have to misrepresent the truth in order to uh, attack it, right? Either misrepresent it or not represent it at all. Uh, because if you, if you actually lay things out so that people can see the whole picture, people can then make their own decision about whether something's true or not. That is, you bring all the scriptures together, you bring all the evidence, you do it all in an open way. Now, the thing that that's sort of... Uh, Funny about it is I know people who accept the 2520, friend of mine and, and Kelly's, Peter Plum, he commented on the video talking about how July 18th, you know, 
is, you know, satanic and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's so funny that we, we can't see that we're doing the same type of thing that was done against us in regard to the 2520 when it comes to something like July 18th. Right. That, that we, we can't see that we're not equal in how we, we deal with things. Now, now Peter Plum is just, you know, he, he's, he's, he can be a little harsh sometimes, but you know, he's a good friend. Um, both Kelly and I know him well. Kelly probably knows him better than me, but, um, you know, and he has a respect for me and Kelly as well. So even though he says all these things and these comments, you know, it's not like he, he thinks we're satanic or evil. So it, it you know, it kind of gives a wrong impression of what he says. But but he's never really taken the time to look at, at July 18th, right? You just got this thing, you know, no time setting. So you guys set time. So it's wrong. I'm not going to look at it. And 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 we've talked before about the idea that, uh, you know, when when a brother differs, you know, you don't you know make him out to be a heretic or misrepresent his views, right? But you take time to sit down with him and go over what he believes point by point um, because you don't know, maybe there is something that, that he's presenting that, that you hadn't noticed before. And so this, this, how we study and, and we've done this in the other, in the, in the morning study as well. It's just, it's not about, you know, winning an argument. It's about being open and honest, transparent, looking at everything recognizing that that uh, when we receive light, we need to see ourselves as a sinner. So the study of God's word is definitely connected to uh, the Christian life and the transformation of character and obedience. They go hand in hand. You know, if you want to have more light, you need to walk in the light that you have. So you have to be obedient, right? And And of course, Obedience comes with the study of God's word itself. So it, they sort of work together. So um, I, I can't remember what the original question was. <laughs> well, I find it interesting in these situations where we can read that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It does mm-hmm. not say all scripture is given by inspiration of the adversary. Right. So Satan has not produced any of God's word. I mean, he said, ye shall not surely die. So there are things he says in scripture. But God is the one who reveals that. If Satan were to uh, present his take on what happened in the Garden of Eden, uh, he would say quite something quite different about what he actually said. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> right. So... When we have one that pontificates as being a pastor of the word that chooses to decry Miller's use of Leviticus 26 as a blind prophecy, and calling it one of Satan's bag of tricks, I find a reason to stand and to state why I am in disagreement. Okay. Now, who is this who's, that you're quoting from? Is this, um, um, what's his name? I don't know what's his name. Uh, from, um, he was in the church there. He was brought into the church. I just can't think of his name. Was this, I can't think of it. The guy who looks like Chevy Chase. I, I would think that's a great insult to Chevy Chase. <laughs> they look the same. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, what's his name? You know the one who looks like Chevy Chevy Chase. Steve Wahlberg. Is that the one who you're talking? Is that what he said or is that somebody else? Yes. It was Steve Wahlberg? Okay. Yes. Now, it's it's intriguing to me. I'm going to read a paragraph before we continue, because the next the next page has got some things that are very pointed for us to think about. I ran across an article this last week 
which I shared with Theodore. I was very, I, I just, I, I was absolutely gobsmacked when I saw the way that this was being presented. This article begins, William Miller computed 15 mathematical proofs that he asserted proved the second coming would occur in 1843. He interpreted many other scriptures in a manner that Francis D. Nickel characterized as far-fetched. Since Ellen White endorsed Miller as a second advent John the Baptist, several of Miller's failed prophetic intervals and signs of the end were retained in her writings. These were purportedly literal, common-sense interpretations that Miller obtained by scripture and a concordance alone. Ellen White's community claimed to follow the same literal method of merely letting the Bible interpret itself. But as this series of articles will demonstrate, Miller was immensely dependent upon previous Bible commentators, and his interpretations are as fanciful and allegorical as the early church father, Origen of Alexandria. These vestigial remnants of Millerism have become more and more untenable as we approach the second centennial of Ellen White's birth in 2027. This initial column begins with a prophetic period, the 2520 time of the Gentiles, which Ellen White endorsed, but that the Biblical Research Institute itself has branded as incorrect. <laughs> now, who's that? That's uh, uh, Donald Casebolt. Okay, I've never heard of him. But but that's in, in Spectrum? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, speculation. I like to call Spectrum Magazine speculation magazine. Well, they're quite, a, quite, quite anyway. out, they're out in the field. Well, here's yeah. the point. They're admitting in this that Mrs. White accepted the time of the Gentiles, mm -hmm. but the Biblical Research Institute has branded this as incorrect. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear that Ellen White did accept the 2520. I yes. mean, I, I've shown it, but people who want to believe in the spirit of prophecy and reject the 2520 can't have that. But uh, here in this case, uh, these people, of course, reject the spirit of prophecy so they can accept that Ellen White did accept the 2520. So, so it is kind of interesting that uh, you have this honesty on the part of, of this group of people, at least in that area. But, but I mean, I mean, going back to the other point, when it comes to the 2520, the people who reject it, they, they don't actually look at it. They just try to deal with Ellen White's statements, right? So when she talks about uh, the prophetic periods, you know, were seen to end in 1843 or now seem to end in 1844, even though on the chart, the only prophetic periods that she could be referring to on the chart are the 2520 and the 2300 days, because no other prophetic period is affected by that. The 70 weeks is not on the 1843 chart and so forth. You can show them all these things, uh, but, uh, you know, they just don't want to believe in the 2520. Right. So. I, uh, <clears throat> I posted in the chat uh, about Victor Gill and Theodore, you've probably had the same conversation with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> about the 2520. I, uh, I asked him about it. and No, no, not asked him. He, I knew that he agreed with it. And I asked him about Walter Weiss, what he thought of it. He told me that that he Walter Weiss does believe that 2520 is true, but cho chooses not to present it publicly because it would be divisive somehow. So it's interesting that we have a closet 2520 believer, and here in the presentation I posted a link where Walter Weiss talks about <clears throat> is presenting on the 2300, and uh, at the beginning he says. It's the title is the Bible's longest time prophecy, and in the beginning he says it, and then he says, "But really, it's not. The twenty-five twenty 
is the longest time prophecy. So he's on public record saying that. And then he says, but we're not going to talk about that one today. And then he goes on. It's the only place I've seen someone of prominence say that publicly on the public record. Well, now, of course, to be fair, it was, was before courage. the 2520 was an issue. I don't know about how much of an issue. I was being disfellowshipped over it at the time. You know, but when he made that video, when he made the video oh. where he talked about that, that's actually quite a bit earlier. Right. Well, okay. That's before it's the still... 2520 was being talked about. Mm -hmm. What okay. is the year on that one? Does it say? Oh, look, you guys go on. Um, yeah, I don't know the year, but I know that it was it was older. It was from one of his evangelistic series. Okay. Okay. Now, we're going to page 45 of this presentation. And, of course, 45 doesn't mean anything to anybody. We, yet we come to these verses. Ezekiel 33, 21 to 23. And it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, in the 10th month, in the 5th day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. And now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening, before he that was escaped came, and had opened my mouth until he came unto me in the morning. And my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. Then the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land. Now, why is it important here that this is being said by God to Ezekiel, that you eat with the blood, you lift up your eyes toward the idols, you shed blood, and why shall you possess the land? What is there about this that, that relates to us? Is the eating of the blood something that is covered in the Ten Promises? I'm, I'm not, so you're saying that, that they shouldn't eat the blood of the animal. Is that somewhere in the Ten Commandments? Yes. Well, no, no. Right. But the worship of idols, lifting up the eyes to the idols, that is definitely in the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. So is this verse then linking the statutes and the commandments together as being necessary for the possession of the land? Yes. Now, of course, there is a connection of you know, the eating of the blood, one is that the pagan sacrifices, they didn't, they didn't kill the animals in the way that the Jews did. Right. Right. So, I mean, if you were eating the blood with the animal, that is, you would strangle it. Right. So that was part of just a different practice. Now, now part of that, of course, is symbolic, you know, and it also could be some health issues regarding that as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a connection between certain, I mean, there's different types of statutes. I mean, because when we studied the whole thing about the moral and the ceremonial law, like the ceremonial law is not a condemnatory law. The Ten Commandments are what reveal our sin. The ceremonial law, there's different aspects to it. Some of it is is an expansion of the Ten Commandments, Right. That is, it's you know delineating some things like what fornication is and so forth, adultery and all that. Um, some of it is, um, uh, you know, symbolic, right? Obviously, the sacrifices and so forth aren't really moral precepts, but they they point forward to Christ, and and you know, and even some of the things that could appear moral also have symbolic aspects to them. So. I mean, they're definitely connected. Okay. Just just uh, kind of going backward here a bit. So it was 2018 when Victor Hill said that in an amazing discussion. Well, I saw the video, a video of him in 2010 saying the same thing. 
Interesting. So they must have just reposted it or something. Yeah, that's what I think. It's just an old video. Because he looks way younger in the video. Mm, about it. Yeah. Yeah. An amazing man. Yeah, I visited him a couple of times. Heidi and I did. Okay. And his and his wife's very nice too. Nettie. Yes. And I went to school with uh oh, what's his son's name? Just slipped my mind. Kim. Hey. Yeah, I was in grade 12 with him at CUC. So Ezekiel 3326. <clears throat> you stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile everyone his neighbor's wife. And shall ye possess the land? Say thou thus unto them, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely they are in the wastes shall fall by the sword. And him that is in the open field Will I give to the beasts to be devour him, to be devoured, and they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. So, so one thing you can see here, if we if we looking at Leviticus twenty six, is we definitely see the connection in the symbolism here with Leviticus twenty six, right? And um, now. In, in Ezekiel, it's kind of interesting because um, chapter five and six, um, he heavily quotes from Leviticus 26. Right. I, I made a chart of it one time of all the different uh, allusions to Leviticus 26. And, and we know that Ezekiel is addressing here uh, the fourth of the seven times. Right. Okay. Which is a repeat of all the first three. Because it's a three-one combination, right? You have the the first three, you know, uh, Manasseh, uh, 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 Daniel's captivity, right? Um, then Jehoiachin's captivity, and then finally Zedekiah's captivity, in which everything's going to be destroyed, right? So you know, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. So you know that. You know, for people who try to say Leviticus 26 isn't a prophecy, I mean, pretty much Ezekiel is is basing his prophecy on Leviticus 26 of the destruction of Jerusalem. And of course, we can see the 70 years is based upon Leviticus 26 as well. But uh, but this is a good verse to show that. So here you stand upon your sword and in the 1769 King James. <clears throat> We would have a reference here to wisdom, verse 211. Let our strength be in the law of justice, for that which is feeble is found to be nothing worth. Our strength is in Christ. Christ is the law. <clears throat> now, for I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then they that know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate because of all of their abominations, which they have committed. How are we to accept this? How are we, how are we to take these two verses? We okay, accept- well, so the, so the pomp of her strength, we know that's the pride of her power. Right. Which um, in... You know, in this context, I I think that's referring to the sanctuary. How many times have any of us heard of how we are to have great respect for whomever is the president of the general conference? How many times are the presidents of the general conference being treated as if they were the very voice of God? Um, well, I've never heard that. I've heard it quite well, I'm, not, I'm not in the loop. <laughs> okay. What uh, was the pride of the power for the nation of Israel? Well, in this I, context, in this context, I still think, um, you know, in, in doing a reference here, because there is this, uh, I'm going to have to look it up to, to show you this, but... Uh, I think there is a connection to the sanctuary dealing with um, because it talks about this earlier. So this is going to be when the the escapee comes, right? 
So in verse 21, he's going to come. And so, so the escapee comes. And then in 33, 28, for I will lay the land most desolate, the pomp of her strength shall cease. So if we look at that um, pride of her power, obviously we connect it to the kingship in Leviticus 26. But it, it's also connected to the sanctuary in Ezekiel. Where is it here? 24, no, no, 20, yeah, 24, just trying to find this statement. Here, just go on while I find this here. Okay, so. It's 20, uh, 24, 21, where it talks about the excellency of your strength. So these are, I, I take them as, which is going to be, the sanctuary is going to be destroyed. Speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary the excellency of your strength. Okay. And um, so that word uh, excellency is pride or pomp and, and strength is Oz. Right. So when you look at, um, where is it here? Ezekiel 33 verse 28. It's going to be uh, the same words, right? So the pomp of her strength. So he says the sanctuary in Ezekiel 25, verse 27, I think I said. Okay. And then Ezekiel 33, 28. So it's going to be exactly the same phrase, but he says it's the sanctuary in the one verse here. So, so I think the land is referring to the land and the pomp of her strength here is referring to the sanctuary, even though it's, it's already been destroyed in Ezekiel 33, but. So, in looking at this from the Hebrew, mm -hmm. where it is saying, for I will lay the land most desolate, but the alternative, alternative Hebrew reading says desolation and desolation. Yeah, so you have t two different words. Okay. Uh, Shamama, devastation, and Meshama waste now of course they're related to each other as you should be able to tell by uh, the sound shamama mm -hmm. and meshama so they're just kind of uh well the the two consonants are reversed so instead of the mem at the beginning as you get in meshama the other one has with the sha sh uh, um, uh you know so you got the sh sound there so you got the m S H M H Meshama. So that's waste or amazement. So I don't know if that's really the words are related. I mean, they're related uh, in 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 that the Hebrew letters themselves are symbols. Um, but it could also sort of be a play of sounds why they put the two together. Okay. Yeah, desolation and desolation. You know, one is waste or amazement, astonishment desolate that's the meshama and then the shamama is devastation figuratively astonishment so yeah i'd have to look at uh, the connection between these two words um not quite sure okay anyway yeah they are they i'm pretty sure they're related but anyway i'm just looking this up Okay, but I mean, just from what, what I'm seeing here from the English portion of this, mm -hmm. would this be another reference to the second angel's message? Well, yeah, as we as we know that in Hebrew, when they're going to have uh, a superlative, that's what it's called, um, they double the word. Right. <clears throat> now, um, and you're going to see that in the next verse where it says, when I've laid the land most desolate, Right. Most mm -hmm. be superlative. It's it's exactly the same two Hebrew words. OK. Yeah. So, I mean, we can say it, it relates to the second angel's message. Yeah. So so that word uh, four, nine, two, three, it says in Brown Drivers Briggs that it's from eight, zero, seven, four. Now, eight, zero, seven, four is related to eight, zero, seven, seven. Right. So eight zero seven four, uh, the root word that both of these words come from. 
is um, uh, shamam, which is an Aramaic word, which means to be stunned. Right. So, the, so they it's actually an Aramaic loan word, according to Brown Drivers Briggs. That's become a, uh, a a Hebrew word, and and two different Hebrew words come from that one Aramaic word. It's kind of interesting, and it's also um, uh, the form of Shemam is interesting because it's 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 a uh, a form that's an Aramaic form called Ithpolel or Ithpola. Which okay. is not something you get in in Hebrew, so I'm not sure what that means. It says CLBL. I'm not sure what that means, but it means to. So it's it's the form of a verb. It's a verbal form that because uh, unless it's because hith hithpol I understand in Hebrew, but not ithpol. That's weird. Anyway, that's just me rambling. So anyway, the point is they are doubling of a word in two different forms, right? So it is a superlative and it can represent the second angel's message. Now, if you think about this, this is the fourth angel, right? The fourth seven times, which is a doubling of the second angel. Right. So definitely it does apply. Now, a comment that was made here in the chat, since hatred of a neighbor or brother is similar to murder, Leviticus 19, 18, 1 John 3, 15. I think shedding of the blood is the potential outcome here regarding Ezekiel 33, 25. But I agree. I, I see the elements here with the fourth angel. Yeah, the fourth seven times. And the fourth seven times, yes. Now, here we are given also thou son of man the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another every one to his brother saying come i pray you and hear what the word what is the word that cometh forth from the lord so this thought this next portion of ezekiel the children of thy people still are talking against thee or of thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, every one to his brother saying, come, I pray you and hear what is the word that cometh from the Lord. What are we talking about here? What What's being represented in this portion? This, this, this kind of strange, that word desolation. <clears throat> yeah, and Ezekiel, in Ezekiel thirty-three, yes, sir. It don't show it. Don't show it in the uh, strong concordant hard, but hardback. So, what you're saying is this word that we we were addressing before on this on most desolate is not being shown in Strong's. The hardback, yeah. What year was that Strong's published? It's 18, it says, uh, let's see. What, what does it not have in it? <clears throat> the hardback, I look up desolations, right? And it's, um, and the only, only reference it gives is Ezekiel 35, 9. For the word desolation. For the word des, is D-E-S-O-L-A-I-A. T I O N S. Desolation. Desolations. Yeah. And it's still not, you don't show it in uh, desolation either. It shows 23, 33, and 7, 27, but it don't show, it don't show 33. I don't know if that means anything, but I found it kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. What the reason I asked you the question, brother, was that I have found differences depending on the year in which the Strong's concordance was published. Is it the revised, the revised, the revised this revised first print is 1982. Okay. And it says it's copyrighted in 1964 and 1965. Right. I had, I believe I still have this packed away 
a copy that was published in two in the year 2001. And I have another copy, but I don't remember when it was published. And the two are very different in the way that they approach a lot of the the different words. I now, just thought it was interesting. I didn't I didn't see. I agree. I think it is very interesting. Okay. As we are here on the 49th page of this presentation, as we are looking at Ezekiel 33:30, we have a passage that we're going to need to think about. We're going to need to consider before we are able to go forward with this for this next week. Now, do we have any other comments or thoughts based on what we have studied today? Well, well, we will we'll go back to verse 29 next next week. Okay. Is there some That's fine. Like that? I think. Well, maybe maybe 30 is is good. I don't know. We'll see. Uh I have no problem with us going back over 28, 29, and 30 this next yeah. week. I'm just okay. laying a challenge out. I'm going to I'm going to give you the Hebrew number for that. Okay. Um, uh, for that is 8077 is the Hebrew number for it. Yeah. Yeah. 8077. There again, okay. that's an interesting number. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Any other requests? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for showing us and guiding us and helping us to understand more clearly your word and the words of your prophets. Help us today that we may rightly divide the word of truth so that we may stand as a watchman should stand to give the warning that you would seek to have given. Bless us this day. Direct us in all that you would have us to do. For may your will be done. And we pray that we may assemble again to glorify you, to lift up your name, and to be prepared for that which you would have us to do. For this we thank you, and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.